Given your unique perspective as a missionary who's traveled abroad, what advice would you give to the church in America? I think the big thing is for people to learn the culture. You know, when they're going somewhere, read books, find out. Now, <coughs> some of the words in America that are perfectly normal here, in Scotland, the class is cursing. And we've had people come and preach and maybe use a word off the platform, and you can feel like an electric current goes through the church. Yes. But then the, they say, what was happening there? And when you explain, they've not do it again. It's like coming here. Um, you can say, like people just say to me, what, what do you want to eat? And I say, oh, I'm easy. You see, well, they told me in America, you can't say that in America, you know. This means I don't mind anything, you know. But <laughs> I, it's, you can get in hot water with words, you know. It's your experience. That's, were you going to say something? I'm just talking about... Uh, The people in Scotland that experience revival and uh, they committed themselves to prayer and they didn't look at the events and the circumstances that was, you know, churches that were dying, people were backsliding. They didn't, they didn't reckon, they didn't look around and assess the situation. They just committed themselves to prayer. And lo and behold, a miracle happens, you know. You know, the revival swept the coasts. Um, and one of the wonderful things that happened, talking to the people who experienced revival, especially the elderly people, one of the characteristics was that they sang all day long. They sang courses all day long. And uh, families were radically changed and homes were revolutionized. The revival swept the coasts on both the west and the east coast of Scotland. And some of them heard the angels singing. Uh, church doors were flung open and were closed. Football games were cancelled because nobody was attending them, you know, because revival was on the move. Pubs were closed down because revival was on the move. And that happened through prayer and dedication of now we, Christians. Was, is that the revivals that happened uh, at the, the turn of the century, yes. around that time? Around right about um, 1930 and 48, was it 48 mm -hmm. when they, Duncan Campbell mm -hmm. on the islands? Yeah, just the yeah. mid-50s, mid mm. you know. The, the heavens were opened and I would... People uh, fell down in the street repenting, uh, but nobody preaching. <laughs> the policeman that came to stop, in one place, the policeman that came to stop the service, he fell down in the door, coming through the door. Yeah. <laughs> it's your experience that's unique to the country that you minister in. Mm -hmm. I think you already kind of answered it there, but I don't know if you think of anything else that you want to add. It's unique to our country. Yeah. Well, our country really is... It was the land of the Bible, and even people that weren't church people prayed at home, mm -hmm. read the Bible every night, although they weren't Christians and they didn't go to church. Mm -hmm. Nothing when moved on a Sunday or, you know, that's the way it was. But today, and you learn the Bible and you had to repeat it in school, but now all that's changed. Everything in culture has changed. We have one in five people drawing money from the government. And one city, not about 200 miles south of us, they call it the, what do they call it, the, si the sick, sick, the sick note. note city, because Europe. of Europe, because so many are on the sick, they just don't want to go to work. And then we have one in five babies born either alcoholic or drug addict, and they have to be detoxed at birth. So that's horrendous. And they tell us that that Scotland has the highest cancer and heart disease in Europe. In fact, they had so many worse things for our country last year in the paper that it's quite scary. Yeah. Thought, hey, mm -hmm. where are we going? What's happening to us? I think in that yeah. aspect is that I think that the church community recognizes that God isn't going to do anything without moving through his church. 
Maybe we've lost that. Maybe lost that. The, the, we are the recipients and we are the demonstrators of what God has given us. And the sin of man won't be touched unless the church moves and uh, preaches that glorious gospel, you know. Yeah, and it, through the pillars of, of society, as, as the bedrock of society is, you know, the church. And it's moved away even back home where the church was the center of the community. Mm -hmm. And now it's football, it's the pub. Mm -hmm. It's shifted and we need to get back to that time. This is the last question, and Pastor asked you Sunday night, and I love the answer that you gave, and I want to ask you if you just uh, repeat the story you shared, uh, the, the, share a testimony of something that God did in your ministry that you call a miracle, and I remember the story about the, uh, the clothes that was stolen from the, your children. Mm -hmm. Well, the children, it was a whole year of pocket money. Now, there were still 19 children at home, so that you know they didn't have much pocket money either. But they saved these pennies and coppers to buy Dad a suit for Christmas. So they purchased the suit, had it made and purchased it. And they went to the church to practice for the Christmas play. And they placed the bag behind the organ. And they heard a noise and my son said they came running out and there was ash on the church carpet and a smell of smoke, but the bag was gone. Now, these children, only five of our own, the other are children that have come from great sorrow, many of them. And so here was a great test that helped to buy this and now it's stolen from the very house of God. So the girls prayed that God make him guilty and he'll bring it back. And I never forget the big policeman putting his eyes up as if he said, you know, this won't happen. And he said, it's Christmas. He said they followed the children from the men's wear shop to the church and waited their chance. It'll never come back. And they kept praying and they really believed it. You know, they said, Mum, I'll be here. I'll be here for Christmas. And on the very next Sunday night, the church door opened and the scruffy man came in, flung the bag right up the aisle and, and ran for his life right out the door, didn't they? And then the children, they jumped out, there was pews in that little church, jumped out the pews and they were pulling the bag open, you know, and this is the middle of the service. It didn't matter, they wanted the bag. And the shout, it's here, Dad, it's here. And it was all um, smoky and the shirt was dirty, the tie was all creased. And then the said, he's gave you an overcoat as well with a button sticker and one of them said, he probably hope he never stole it, you know. But, you know, there came a time when four of those children had a very difficult episode in their life. And as they were going out our door, one of them turned and said, well, if God could look after a suit, he'll look after me. You know, and you don't forget these kind, God's so practical. He really shows you and the most important thing in your life, he will touch that. So really to us, that was a highlight. And in fact, the Sunday papers, they must copy the local news, I imagine. And the Sunday Post, which is quite famous in Scotland, they had a big article that said, well, others follow suit, and it does you I-T-E. You know, and they'd obviously got it out the local paper that somebody had returned all the things, you know. But that is an example. So whatever yeah. happens in our life, mm. God is a silent listener and a watcher, a people watcher. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Okay. That concludes our interview.